Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan and today I'd like to talk about Starve Acre by Andrew Michael Hurley. And I'd like to just um, explore this supernatural horror novel um, and uh, look at some of the themes that crop up in it as well as uh, go through the structure of the plot. Now this was published in 2019. Um, I understand it's being made into a film starring Matt Smith. Um, it was recommended to me whilst I was in a bookshop in North London. Uh, the bookseller said I really must read it. So uh, I'm going to just share my thoughts. I suppose if you could sum up this uh, book in a sentence, it's about the reawakening of an old and uh, very localised evil. Um, there's this kind of evil presence which um, lurks in this uh, village. Um, that's what the, the plot revolves around. And um, the book is set in the 1950s. We're introduced to Richard and Juliet, uh, a middle class couple who, um, who have gone through a terribly traumatic event. Their young son has died unexpectedly. And um, they're trying to rebuild their lives and navigate their way through the grieving process. So they're in this really dark place and Richard's been allowed to take some sabbatical leave uh, from his position as a university academic. Um, I think he studies anthropology or archaeology, something where he digs things up, I know that. And uh, he uh, goes to this house he's inherited from his father called Starve Acre with Juliet. And uh, they're trying to rebuild their lives. And uh, it's somewhere in the Yorkshire Moors and the place is just thick with snow. Um, we're approaching spring, but it's still very cold and very bleak. Now, Richard, um, to, to keep himself intellectually engaged, um, is trying to find this, um, this ancient tree, which, is, uh, which lives long in the collective memory of the villagers who live around Starve Acre. Uh, the house where Richard and Juliet live. The remnants of this tree apparently are long buried in a field and Richard um, goes to this field and tries to uh, find it. He excavates this area in a field, he constructs a tent uh, and uh, when he uh, digs down he thinks he finds the roots and he finds this skeleton of a hare which he takes out and he uh, take, puts it in a box and takes it home with him, back to his study. Now Richard, um, whilst he's at his father's old house, Starvaker, he uh, uncovers these um, intriguing woodblock prints about uh, this tree, which was called the Stithwaite Oak. And um, there seems to be some rather sinister uh, memories concerning this tree. Evil events have uh, been associated with this tree and Richard seems to wants to get to the bottom of it. Now Richard uh, reassembles this hair skeleton in his study and uh, Richard becomes rather fascinated with it. In the meantime they have this rather kindly uh, uh, neighbour, his name's Gordon, a gay chap who um, who's part of this occult group, this kind of spiritualist group called the Beacons. And, um, and they're headed by the, this mysterious uh, woman called Mrs. Ford. Now, um, Gordon um, is uh, an old friend of Richard and um, Juliet, and he wants to help them. And he suggests that the Beacons, this group, should uh, visit their house and conduct some kind of seance uh, he believes that they could heal Juliet in particular, who's really suffering uh, emotionally with her grief. Now Juliet's happy to have them round, Richard less so. And by this point, Juliet's sister, Harry, is, uh, has come up as well. She's rather a busybody, but she's got her sister's uh, best interests at heart. Eventually, uh, this group come over to the house and they conduct this ritual and uh, and they have these candles which flicker and the lights go off and it all looks very impressive 
and uh, Richard of course just thinks it's all smoke and mirrors. Juliet though thinks this is absolutely genuine and she has some kind of vision and instantly she seems to be cured of uh, this nagging grief. Uh, all of a sudden she seems to have the strength uh, and the peace in her heart to get on with her life. Um, Richard and her uh, Juliet's sister Harry uh, uh, basically think these people are kind of uh, got uh, ulterior motives, they're very suspicious of them. However, on the way out, Mrs. Ford, the leader of this group, has this extreme reaction. She senses this enormous evil in the house, which uh, almost physically knocks her over. She's really shaken by this. And she's taken away um, from the house. It seems there is something very real around spiritually, and it's not friendly. Now, uh, Richard finds more of these prints hidden away in the house. These, these probably, these like 17th century uh, woodblock prints, and um, which shed more light on what this Stithway tree was all about, this Stithway oak was all about. And somewhat magically, the skeleton of the hair um, reanimates. The bones seem to glue themselves back together, sinews start to grow before Richard's eyes. The internal organs develop, uh, the skin grows, the hair grows, the fur. And before he knows it, there's this, um, this old hair, the, the, the kind of, the, this uh, dead hair has come back to the age when it died. And it's uh, very aggressive, rather frightened, hungry, Richard feeds it and eventually he lets it out into the woods. Some kind of miracles taking place in Starvaker. Juliet, in the meantime, uh, feels that she can now start to uh, move Ewan's toys out of his bedroom and start to redecorate the house. It seems she's really turned a corner because of the visit of Mrs Ford and the Beacons. Now, during this first part, um, and the second part as well for that matter, uh, we have um, a kind of a backstory of um, a few years before when Ewan was alive. And Ewan seems to have been this rather troubled boy. Um, in part one, we find out that um, he um, attacked a girl in his class at school, in a primary school. And... Um, that kind of caused the family to be ostracised and to be treated as outcasts in the village. Um, so they never really fit in uh, to that area. Um, we also find out that Ewan almost started a fire in the house, that Ewan, uh, for some reason, violently attacked a snowman he made. Ewan seems to have uh, something very dark within him. In part two, we find out that Ewan could hear this voice, this person talking to him called Jack Gray. And uh, Jack Gray was telling him to do things. It seems this Jack Gray was telling him to start this fire to attack this girl in his classroom, which we uh, heard about in part one. And uh, somewhat shockingly, Jack Gray, this voice in Ewan's head, tells him to blind a pony at this uh, village fate. The villagers are just aghast at this uh, gruesome spectacle. Ewan also is um, referred to a psychiatrist and you know that and that's where we kind of uh, leave Ewan. He's this deeply troubled boy. We don't actually find out how he died. Um, when we go back to the present, if you like, with Richard and Juliet, Richard finds this woodprint of the tree being used as, um, as a place of execution with these ewes being uh, hanged off the branches. And he finds out a bit about these characters. They seem to go out of their mind and uh, do crazy things. Uh, thus they were executed, but it seemed to be something of a stain on the uh, village's history. 
Now this hair, which um, miraculously came back to life, which Richard let go into the woods, comes back and it becomes uh, somewhat of a menace. It kills Harry's dog, Harry's Juliet's sister, remember. It creates mayhem and fear, except for Juliet. She um, starts to cradle it. She starts to um, put it even into a, a, a pram, wheels it around. She sees something of Ewan in this hair, somewhat improbably and somewhat unsettlingly. So Juliet's obsessed with the hair and Richard excavates the, uh, the tree and he finds these, uh, these boughs from which these people were, were hanged. He knows that this really happened. And he finds the final set of wood prints whereby um, this Jack Gray character who um, was speaking to you and their son is referred to on these pictures. It seemed Jack Gray was behind these youths' uh, crimes a few hundred years before. And it seems Jack Gray was also linked to this hair because this the picture of this hair is also on this print. Richard now knows that this hair is thoroughly evil. Something needs to be done about it. And as he goes back, he sees Juliet nursing this hair from her breast. That's how the book ends. So what do I make of it? This book's very much in the vein of um, kind of British uh, supernatural horror, you know, you think of films such as The Wicker Man, for instance, a kind of folky horror, which seems to be something in the kind of British DNA, I think. And such themes, I suppose, as um, evil spirits, uh, possession, are rather well-trod uh, tropes uh, in fiction, but enjoyably scary nonetheless, you know, and uh, the book says something, I think, of a frightening possibility of evil in children. Uh, some of the book's most chilling passages are when Ewan, their boy, goes around at the instigation of this spirit, Jack Grey, and does these terrible things. Um, and, you know, particularly when he blinds the pony, I mean, um, that's really quite shocking. I mean, this is a really... A uh, terrible description of the injury this uh, this poor pony suffers at a uh, human's hands. Its legs shivered and it shook its bowed head as if it were trying to dislodge flies from its nose. Taking hold of its reins, they managed to turn the animal and lift its chin to see what had happened. One eye stared at the people standing around. The other had been stabbed to glue. Stabbed to glue. What a, a stomach churning description of this poor half-blinded pony um, and do you know what this book is so well written I mean the, the quality of the prose is is really it's really high I mean it's this isn't your um, run-of-the-mill writer this is someone who really knows uh, how to uh, structure beautiful sentences actually I think the, the standout moment for me in this book is the, the, the whole scene around the seance. I mean, that is really unsettling and um, brilliantly written and you're just on the edge of your seat reading it. It's just really fantastic. I think my interest in the book slightly dipped towards the end, despite reading that apparently the last sentence, um, you know, is a real game changer. And, you know, it is a good way to end a book, but my, I did feel the book... As I suppose with many horrors, you, there's often, how they're resolved is often a bit of a letdown. Um, I'm not saying it's bad or anything, but it, I think the highlight for me was perhaps kind of around the middle of the book. Uh, I think that's where it's at its strongest. So, um, yeah, Star of Acre, I mean, I do recommend it. If you're into this kind of folky, British um, horror stuff in the middle of the countryside, you know, read it. It's ex expertly written as well. A really stylish of the way Hurley writes and um, yeah have a read good book um, thanks for watching and I've just um, left a brief slideshow of uh, some of the themes and the structure
Thanks. Bye.